Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number five of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Miracles Around the Lake. It is ready for teaching on August 3. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for what your word shows to us. It shows us what you were like. It shows us through the life of Jesus here in the book of Mark what you were like. But it also shows us that there is hope for us regardless of our situation. And Lord, today I'd like to pray that each of us as we study this lesson may come to know Jesus better. No one understand exactly what the message is here but also that each of us may take that step closer to walking with him. And particularly for those who haven't made that step, Lord, I pray that today and this week as they study, that they will want to walk with Jesus. And today I'd really like to pray for some people who've asked for your help. I'd like to pray for Rosalind Joseph and her family in the USA, for Charmaine Scott, and she has a health problem, Lord, and Please look after her and her extended family and Jocelyn Cumberbatch and may she have a closer walk with you and Venus Waller and family in Jamaica and Rowan Hopper and Agnicio Jones from Costa Rica and Thelma Manray. Lord, she has some health problems and requests our prayers. As we open your word this week, we pray that our walk will not just be closer with you, but will also be an effect on those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 5 and verse 19. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And Antonia, will you read it for us again? I'm Antonia from Harvey Bay. And our memory verse is from Mark chapter 5, verse 19. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Mark chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus' ministry was largely focused in Galilee, especially in and around the Sea of Galilee, a lake approximately 13 miles or 21 kilometres long and 8 miles or 13 kilometres wide. It is the largest body of water in the area and was the centre of life for people living nearby. Mark 4 ends with Jesus and his disciples travelling across the Sea of Galilee. A storm arises that Jesus calms by speaking to the wind and waves. Mark 6 ends with a similar scene, but this time with Jesus walking on the water toward his disciples in the boat. In between these two scenes on the water are numerous miracles of Jesus that were done on land and his disciples' first missionary activity. These stories are the subject of this week's study. The overarching characteristic of these dramatic stories is to let the reader see who Jesus is. He is the one able to calm a storm, cast out demons, heal a woman who simply touches his clothes, raise a dead girl, preach in his hometown, send out his disciples on a preaching mission, feed with a few loaves and fish, the walk on water, incredibly displays of power that are drawing the disciples closer to the understanding that he is the Son of God. Sunday, July 28, Calming a Storm Read Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. What happens in this story? And what lessons can we take from it about who Jesus is? First of all, Mark 4, beginning at verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, 
let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind dried down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. At the beginning of Mark chapter 4, Jesus steps into a boat to teach the crowd on the shore. In Mark 4, 10 to 12, it seems he may have gotten out of the boat and talked with the disciples privately. Let's have a quick look at that. Mark 4, beginning at verse 10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Now, after a long day of teaching, the disciples take Jesus in the boat, as he was, in other words, very tired. He immediately falls asleep on the boat's cushion, which would be in the stern of the boat. A great storm arises on the lake, and the boat is at risk of sinking when the disciples awake him. Dramatically, Jesus commands the wind and waves to cease. The great calm settles over the lake. Understandably, the disciples are deeply afraid at the display of divine power. Read Psalm 104, verses 1 to 9. How does the picture of Yahweh here compare with Christ calming the storm? Psalm 104, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messenger, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. He covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. How does the picture of Yahweh here compare with Christ calming the storm? The story in Mark chapter 4 verses 35 to 41 fits within a common biblical pattern, that of a theophany, the appearance of God or one of his angels. Five characteristics are common in these events. 1. The display of divine power. 2. Human fear. 3. The command do not fear. 4. The words of revelation for which God or the angel appeared. And 5. Human response to the revelation. Four of the five are present in this story. The calming of the storm is the display of divine power. The disciples' fear is the human fear. The question, why are you so afraid, is the do not fear. The disciples' question, who then is this? is the human response. What is missing is the words of Revelation. This missing detail plays into the Revelation secrecy motif that runs through the entire book, where the truth about Jesus will come out. Here the disciples question, Who then is this that the wind and the sea obey him? pushes the reader to fill in the answer of the missing words of Revelation. He is the Son of God the Lord himself. And so to finish today, think about the power of God. 
How can you learn to lean on his power and to trust it in all things in your life? Monday, July 29. Can you hear a whisper above a shout? Read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. What can we learn about the great controversy from this amazing account and again about the power of Jesus? Mark 5, beginning at verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. If the night before the lake was unforgettable, the arrival at the Gadarenes the next morning was just as impressive. The history of the demon-possessed man is laid out in heartbreaking detail. Breaking away from all constraint, he lived in the tombs and cut himself with stones. No one had the strength to subdue him, it says in Mark 5 verse 4 in the ESV, and then he met Jesus. The man rushed to Jesus. No word about the disciples. They probably ran off. When the man came near to Jesus, he fell down before him. The words fell down translate the Greek verb proskineo, usually translated to worship. It seems the man recognized that Jesus was someone who could help him. But when he opened his mouth, the demons inside him shouted at Jesus, who could hear the man's whispered plea for help above the demons' shouts. When they asked to be released into a herd of pigs, Jesus permitted them to enter the pigs. The entire herd, about 2,000, rushed down the embankment and drowned in the water. It was a financial disaster for the owners. What's amazing is that the demons knew exactly who Jesus was. And they also knew their impotence before him, which was why they begged him twice in verses 10 and 12 to do what they asked. Verse 12 read, The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. But in verse 10 before that they had said, And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. 
Obviously, they knew his power over them. This story has two overriding characteristics. First, it is filled with the items of uncleanness or ceremonial defilement according to Old Testament law. Tombs and the dead were unclean. As we read in Numbers 19, verse 11, whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. And verse 16, anyone out in the open who touches someone who has been killed with a sword or someone who has died a natural death or anyone who touches a human bone or a grave will be unclean for seven days. Bleeding made one unclean, as we read in Leviticus 15. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When any man has an unusual bodily discharge, such a discharge is unclean. Whether it continues flowing from his body or is blocked, it will make him unclean. This is how his discharge will bring about uncleanness. And then we go down further... Whoever touches the man who has a discharge must wash their clothes and bathe the water with water, and they will be unclean till evening, verse 7. And then we go down further. A clay pot that the man touches must be broken, and any wooden article is to be rinsed with water, in verse 12. And then we come down to verse 19. When a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Pigs were unclean, as you read in Leviticus 11 and verse 7. And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. But second, overarching this litany of defilement is the back-and-forth battle between good and evil forces. Jesus drives out the demons. Two points for Jesus. The demons kill the pigs. Two points for Satan. The townspeople ask Jesus to leave. Two points for Satan. But Jesus sends back the healed man as his witness. Three points for Jesus. In some ways, this man was the unlikeliest missionary. But he definitely had an amazing story to tell. And so to finish the day, what hope can you draw from this story about the power of Jesus to help you in whatever you are struggling with? Tuesday, July 30. On the Roller Coaster with Jesus. Read Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. What characteristics particularly stand out about Jairus? Mark 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Religious leaders such as Jairus were not typically friends with Jesus. As we see in Mark 1.22, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And Mark 3, verse 2, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And verse 6, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And finally, Luke 13, verse 14. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. So it is likely that he is desperate. This desperation is exemplified by Jairus' falling on his knees before Jesus. His plea is understandable to any parent. His daughter is dying. But he has faith that Jesus can help. Without a word, 
Jesus departs with the Father to go to his home. Read verses 25 to 34 of Mark 5. What interrupts the progress towards Jairus' house? Beginning at verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. The story cuts away to another scene that evokes pity, a woman experiencing twelve terrible years of sickness. This story of Jairus and the woman is the second sandwich story in Mark. In Mark 3, 20-35, which was covered in uh, lesson 3, we read another one. Let's just read that one Quickly, then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. In this story, the contrasting characters, Jairus and the woman, come to Jesus for help. The woman comes up behind Jesus and touches his clothing. Immediately she is well. But Jesus stops and asked, Who touched my clothes? The woman who had been so sick was suddenly well. Yet she feared that Jesus was angry at what had happened. It was a wild ride for her emotions. But Jesus wanted to heal not only her body, but also her soul. Then back to Jairus. And we read this now in Mark 5 verses 35 to 43. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but 
asleep, but they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. It was a wild ride of emotions for the synagogue leader as well. Jesus allowed no one else to go with him and the parents except Peter, James and John. Jesus states that the girl is not dead but asleep. He casts out all the mourners and goes into the room where the dead girl lay. Taking her hand, he says, to Letha Coom. Mark translates these words, little girl, get up. Actually, the word to Letha means lamb, and thus would be a term of endearment for a child in the home. The command to keep things secret is part of the revelation secrecy motif that runs through Mark and points toward who Jesus is and that ultimately he cannot remain hidden. Wednesday, July 31, Rejection and Reception Read Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Why did Jesus' hometown people reject him? Chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Usually when a small town person becomes popular, people back home bask in the attention. Not Nazareth. They were offended and surprised at Jesus' success as a teacher and healer. His shift from being a builder to a teacher seemed hard for them to accept. There also may have been some animosity that he did most of his miracles in Capernaum. As we read in Luke 4.23, Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And he already had a disagreement with his family, as we read in Mark 3, verses 31 to 35. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Read Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 30. How does the mission of the twelve apostles contrast with the beheading of John the Baptist? Mark 6, beginning at verse 7. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, 
leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah. And still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughters of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. This is the third sandwich story in Mark. We saw one in Lesson 3 and in Lesson 5. The mission of the Twelve Apostles in taking the message of Jesus everywhere stands in sharp contrast with the imprisonment and silencing of the Baptist. The disciples are told to travel light and depend on others for support. This strategy actually makes missionaries dependent on the people they serve which helps bond them to those who need their message. But John the Baptist had no such bond with Herod and his family. John's death is told in shocking detail as the plotting Herodias takes advantage of Herod's ambivalence and lust. Herodias' daughter seems to add to the scandalous plan by the grotesque request that the Baptist head be delivered on a platter. The silencing of the clarion call of the Baptist occurs at the same time as the twelve apostles proclaim repentance, just as the Baptist did. John's death foreshadows Jesus. John is put to death, buried, and reported as risen from the dead, as we've just read in verses 14 to 16 and verse 29, as Jesus would be. And we'll read about that later in chapters 15 and 16 of the book of Mark. These parallel stories point toward a coming crisis for Jesus and his followers. And so to finish the day, have you ever been rejected like Jesus was? Or experienced some hard to understand crisis? What did you learn from these experiences that could perhaps help you the next time something like that happens? Thursday, August 1. 
a different kind of Messiah. Read Mark chapter 6, verses 34 to 52. What was the problem Jesus and his disciples confronted, and how was it solved? Mark 6, beginning at verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, That would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them when they saw him walking on the lake, and they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. After the disciples return from their mission, they go with Jesus to a remote area on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee to rest. But a large crowd of 5,000 people arrives at the location before them. Jesus sees that they are like sheep without a shepherd. He teaches them the entire day. In the evening, the disciples recommend sending the crowd away to find food. But Jesus tells them to feed the crowd. The ensuing dialogue in Mark 6 verses 35 to 38, which we've just read, illustrates that the disciples are thinking in human terms about how to solve the problem. However, Jesus resolves the problem by miraculously feeding the large crowd with just five loaves and two fish. Characteristics of this story play into the popular concept of Messiah in Jesus' day. The expectation was that the Messiah would liberate Israel from her enemies and would bring in righteousness and peace. A large number of men in a desert setting would carry with it military overtones of revolt. And we're going to compare here with John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And then in Acts 21 verse 38, Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? This notion is strengthened by the reference to Jesus seeing the people like sheep without a shepherd. A partial quotation from Numbers 27, 17, 
where Moses asked God to appoint a leader for Israel after him. And that verse reads, To go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. This phraseology about a shepherd for God's people appears elsewhere in the Old Testament, typically with reference to Israel's lack of a leader or king. And we compare this with 1 Kings 22, 17. Then Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. And Second Chronicles chapter 18 and verse 16. Then Micaiah answered, I saw Israel, all Israel, scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. And Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 5 and 6. So they were scattered because there were no shepherd. And where they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Yet Jesus does not meet their false expectations. Instead, he sends his disciples away and dismisses the crowd. And rather than lead a rebellion against Rome, what does he do? He retreats to a mountain to pray, not what the people were expecting. In place of the popular view of the Messiah as a king who liberates Israel, he comes to liberate people from the bondage of sin. His walking on the water displays to the disciples that he is indeed the Lord of nature. But he does not come to rule, but to give his life as a ransom for many, as you read in Mark 10.45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so to finish the day, what should this story tell us about why a correct understanding of prophecy is important? If a false understanding of Christ's first coming led to disaster for some, how much more so could a false understanding do the same for some in regard to his second? Friday, August 2. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 363, we read, In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices, and everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed, and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46 verse 10 Here alone can true rest be found, and this is the effectual preparation for all who labour for God. Amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts. End of quote. And then from the same book, page 385. Their dissatisfied hearts queried why, if Jesus could perform so many wondrous works as they had witnessed, could he not give health, strength and riches to all his people, free them from their oppressors and exalt them to power and honour. The fact that he claimed to be the Son of God and yet refused to be Israel's king was a mystery which they could not fathom. His refusal was misinterpreted. Many concluded that he dared not assert his claims because he himself doubted as to the divine character of his mission. Thus, they opened their hearts to unbelief 
and the seed which Satan had sown bore fruit of its kind in misunderstanding and defection. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, how would you respond if someone asked you, what has Jesus freed you from? Two, discuss why it is that God sometimes allows a good person, such as John the Baptist, to be in prison and to be executed. What solace or hope can we find despite these difficult things? Three, what lessons are there in the feeding of the 5,000 for a church congregation with few resources? And four, Compare the popular views of Jesus today with the picture of him in Mark chapter 5 and chapter 6. That is, what about those who use Jesus to seek political power and to dominate others? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Unexpected Change of Heart by Andrew McChesney As a university student, Anoush heard many times, when you graduate, we will give you a job. But when she graduated, no one offered her a job. Father was deeply worried. In Armenia, fathers often help their children get jobs. Some fathers even bribe companies to hire their children. But father didn't give a bribe and Anoush was jobless in her town in Armenia. Then she learned about an interdenominational missionary organization from the United States that was looking for an Armenian translator. The job came with a small salary and required her to relocate temporarily to a nearby city, Vanadzor. She asked father for permission to work as a translator. Armenian is a largely patriarchal society where fathers are consulted on many decisions. Father thought that working with Americans would be a good opportunity for Anush. Yes, you can go, he said. Anush got the job. She was happy. Four years earlier, Father had forbidden her from going to church and getting baptised. Now she was reading the Bible, sharing Jesus with others and getting paid for it. As she worked, a desire grew in her heart to become a missionary. When the job ended, she returned home wondering how she could fulfill her dream. After praying and fasting for three days, she read in Exodus that God told Moses at the burning bush to ask Pharaoh to let his people go to serve him. She felt as though God was saying to her, Go ask Father to let you serve me. She went to Father. Would you allow me to study to become a missionary in another country? She asked. No, he said. The next morning, Anush read in Exodus that Pharaoh rejected Moses' request. But God sent Moses back, saying, Go, talk to Pharaoh. She went to Father. Would you allow me to study in a missionary program to serve God? She asked. No, he said. She continued reading Exodus. Again and again, God sent Moses to talk to Pharaoh. Every time Moses talked to Pharaoh, Anush spoke to her father. Father became upset, and one day he exploded. Can you just go to the local church and get baptised and forget about becoming a missionary in another country, he explained. Anush was confused. She hadn't anticipated such a response. She decided to go to church. She went to a nearby city where an Adventist church was holding evangelistic meetings. When the preacher asked who wanted to be baptised, she stood up. Are you sure? the preacher asked. What about your father? Everyone knew her story. Father is fine with my decision, Anush said. Father didn't stop the baptism. With joy, Anush plunged under the water. <laughs> 